Hello to everybody who's listening to this. My name is Leslie Smith. I'm curator of Tuckley Castle in Staffordshire. And my work here in the last 20 years has been looking after the castle and the collection, but also looking after the history of the people that are important to us. One of those is Mary, Queen of Scots who is such a fantastically interesting person, not least of all because of her dramatic and tragic life. No wonder she's described as the daughter of debate. Here at Tutbury Castle, Mary came. It was her first official prison. But I'm going to go backwards a little bit, if I may. She escaped from Scotland, from Loch Leven, and lost uh, a terrible battle on the way through, thinking she was going to win back her crown and her son in her arms, who, of course, had been born in 66, 1566 in Edinburgh. But in 1568, she was in dire straits. She really thought she was going to get back her crown, but she didn't and lost the Battle of Langside. As a result of that, she went up to Dundrennan with a pocket of people and crossed over into England. Some say in a blind panic, she said, I want to go to France. I've changed my mind, but the winds had caught them and they found themselves irresistibly by nature. And some would say God drawn to England. Some say she only had a handful of people with her. I'm very interested as a person who studies women of the mid 16th century in finding out more detail. And it's worthwhile, of course, looking at original sources if you can. And so therefore, when I looked, she didn't actually have a handful of people with her. She had 15 or 16 people with her. But that's still tiny compared with the retinue of four or 600, which a woman of her status might have expected. When she arrived in England, within a couple of days, she was taken to Carlisle. Carlisle Castle. At that point, she was not a prisoner um, and neither was she treated as one. She was treated very well, but the person in charge got a bit alarmed about her riding out a long way and quickly. She was a fantastic horsewoman. On one occasion, she rode 40 miles in a single day. I mean, that's professional messenger level of riding. So she was strong. Why was he alarmed? Well, he must have known that Elizabeth by then, despite claiming she was not a prisoner, wanted to keep her firmly in her grip. Welcome to the web, said the spider to the fly. Spider was Elizabeth Tudor, and she had her phone. Within uh, a few weeks, about 28th of July, uh, she had gone, she'd gone down to Bolton Castle, started to make her way down through England. She was not at Bolton just a couple of months. She was there, actually, for quite a time. She'd arrived in England in the May. And then, as I've just told you, it was 28th of July when she arrived at Bolton Castle and held... Now, the reason she was held there is very straightforward. She was expecting Elizabeth would come with a huge rescue of people and welcome her and give her a crown back and give her a lot of money, a lot of troops, welcome this Catholic woman, when most of Europe was Catholic, who is nine years younger than her and better looking, some would argue, educated, Tudor blood in her veins through her grandmother, Margaret, Henry VIII's sister, prepared to marry, has a son, a legitimate son, but most crucially, has never been declared a bastard. Elizabeth was by her own father. That made her hot and dangerous property to those people under the surface who were still very much Catholics. They got fined under Elizabeth, she could do with the money, but if they got too pushy about it, it was death. So consequently, we find Elizabeth sending ambassadors out all over Europe and extra envoys to take the pulse of every royal house of Europe. We have the Scotch Queen, was the phrase. Not Scottish, the Scotch Queen. Do you want her? But they didn't want her either. Not Rome, not beloved France, where she was still dowager queen, of course, having been married to Francois, her first husband, dying a boy, uh, coming to Scotland at 18. She was still a queen in that sense of a title. She had, of course, abdicated the throne of Scotland in favour of her son at Loch Leven on the night she'd miscarried. The year before, she'd miscarried twins. Deep, dark night. They came and brought knives to her, not to help her with her delivery, but to put it at her throat. So there we have Mary, dangerous, beautiful, striking, royal into her very bones. And now Elizabeth wants to be sure there's not going to be trouble because she is a Protestant queen and not accepted by some people because the Anne Boleyn marriage was not accepted by some Catholics. So she's checking, 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 which is why it takes her so long. She is then being tracked very well. There's a professor, Patrick Collinson, who's managed to track her daily movements on the way down, bothering to look at court papers and 
For those of you interested, by the way, uh, there are some wonderful papers out there, British History Online, uh, which is free, and it gives you an insight into papers that have in fact been interpreted properly and professionally and in our language so we can read it. So she then finds herself at the gates of Tutbury Castle. Now there's debate even about when that is. Some say the 2nd of February, some say the 3rd, some say the 4th. I've looked very closely ready for this talk today with you who are listening and I'm content that Patrick Hollison's got it right, it's the 4th. So Mary arrives. Now when she came, extra people came and joined the group who came with her. So it's 1569. She's coming up the drive, she's surrounded by people. It's a cold, bitter day, although she's a fantastic horsewoman. She had obviously already been told that now she was a, a prisoner. Previously, she'd been at a housekeep, she like politicians. Well, Elizabeth felt it was safe enough. She was told she was a prisoner. And when she arrived, we know that she vomited black blood at the gates. That's a classic sign of an ulcer of the stomach. She collapsed, her hair fell from under her bonnet. They helped lift her down. She was in a terrible state and they supported her while she walked through the gates of Tutbury Castle. Now, these days, Tutbury Castle is rather a ruin thanks to a man we try not to mention here called Oliver Cromwell, but in its day, it was vast and huge and a royal castle and had been for hundreds of years directly owned by the monarch as the Duke of Lancaster and still is. So in comes Mary. She must have been in a dire strait, you know, because those of you who are listening to this, if there's one thing I want you to do is to understand that history is populated by you and I as well, in the sense of she was absolutely real. She wasn't just a painting. When she put salt or, tongue or, or honey on her tongue, it was the same for her as it is for you. She had two dead husbands, Francois, the second husband, Darnley. And that's, of course, why she was locked up. It was suggested she was implicated in the murder of her second husband, that she could marry her third, Bothwell, who, of course, was going mad in a jail in Denmark, a handsome, swashbuckling, oversexed Bothwell. She had lost twins in a miscarriage. She now realised she was a prisoner. She had lost her crown in France through no fault of her own, so it wasn't really a loss as dowager, but she had lost Scotland. I think it's likely she hoped that in time, if Elizabeth had welcomed her and fated her and looked after her, that she could appeal to the Pope to have that overturned, claiming to be under duress when she gave up her throne for her son at Loch Leven, so her bastard half-brother could take the crown, or certainly control. So she arrives here at Tuckery. Now we're in the heart of England, for those who don't know it, just a few miles up the road, Literally three miles up the road is a place that's described as the absolute middle of England. We're far away from the sea, as you can imagine, and you can see why that would be a good thing, can't you? We don't want to getting out. Elizabeth, with her absolute diamond hard brilliance, recognised this woman was a real threat. But of course, she was supported by probably one of the greatest statesmen, certainly I think he is the greatest statesman that we'd ever had, and that is Burley. William Cecil and his brother and his son Robert would also be absolutely brilliant in the job. And they really, to be honest with you, and Walsingham, head of the spy ring and others, wanted her dead. She's a focus. Your Majesty, she's a focus. But when she first came here, uh, she was put in some very nice apartments, which are royal apartments. In fact, you can still see them. They're not very grand uh, necessarily by palace standards, although it was a royal fortress, but still smart with a beautiful fire. You can still see round the fireplace where there are animals carved into the stone. She would have been in a sense of disbelief. How can this be possible? Elizabeth is my cousin. I'm the queen, I'm the legitimate queen. How can she allow this? Think of her mother. Think of her mother. And that's another reason why, of course, Elizabeth was very squeamish about killing queens. There'd been enough of that in her lifetime. So she's put in some comfort uh, in the, uh, top floor, which of course it would be upstairs, overlooking what she describes a garden fit only for pigs. Uh, thank you for that compliment. <laughs> but of course, the truth of the matter is, uh, Richard III had spent a great deal of money on the garden here, insisting it was well looked after. Then along comes Henry VII, and that's how we know, because he writes a letter saying that Richard III spent much money on the garden here, but it was packed out 
people forget these castles were absolutely stuffed with houses and cobbled streets and dogs barking and smoke rising and bread baking and all the jobs you can imagine, clanking and banging and soldiers. The castle had actually fallen into disrepute for a while, but suddenly some money was being spent on it, or had been before Mary got there. She's looked after by Sir Ralph Sadler, and uh, that, of course, is very important because in time Shrewsbury would be taking over the job. Shrewsbury, husband of the famous Bess of Hardwick, the greatest social climber in English history. She was a brilliant woman, but she was so embittered in time by Mary Queen of Scots believing her husband had fallen in love with her, with Mary. And that sounds quite possible, you know. Mary had great sex appeal. She had a gentleness about her. Men and women were drawn to her. Royalty, of course, tends to make you gorgeous. It helps, no end on the looks front. But she was so striking. She was five foot 11, and with her shoes, she'd be six foot. She had red hair that could tumble down her back and could only be lifted by two hands, not one, some would say, although that sounds unlikely. It's making the point. That red hair, Henry VIII, Edward, Mary Tudor, all this, and the Stuart red hair, of course, flying through. Elizabeth's red hair, there she is, golden red haired, nearly six foot, queen of two nations and heir apparent to this. No wonder Elizabeth didn't want her in London. No wonder she didn't want her anywhere near the coast. Within a few weeks of her being here, a man called Nicholas White arrived and he was envoy uh, to Cecil. Now, the reason that's important is because when Cecil was chosen by Elizabeth to serve in the Privy Council, and he served in the other Tudors, by the way, and didn't mind about the religion or anything. <laughs> he was just such a genius, they all wanted him. She put her hands, Elizabeth of England did, at 25 years of age, on his shoulders and said, you must tell me what I don't want to hear. She was giving him the right to tell the truth. And in fact, it was a demand at a time of enormous flattery. And don't shoot the messenger. She gave him that. And therefore, he picked with great care and his passion for the nation, a truthful envoy. Now, all of you listening to this, whether you are professional historians or not, will know the importance of sources. So we must take Nicholas White as it's reasonable to think he gives us a very accurate picture. He says she's tall and graceful. He says she has a soft wit clouded with mildness. That's lovely. Soft wit, not so sharp like a man. Clouded with mildness, that's a quote. But he recognises she's dangerous. They do, in fact, get into a row about art of all strange things, and she storms out. But what's most crucial is not just her height and his truthfulness and these things. There's nothing just about her height. It made her a queen, Edward the First line, you see, six foot four. It was also because he said she has a soft, lowland accent. Now, I want to press on you how important that is. Mary spoke fluent French. Of course, she did. She was brought up in France from the age of five. Her mother was French, Mary of Guise, and she spoke Latin well. But it's very interesting because she did not have a French accent. Now, beloved of film directors and writers, she is very French all the time. And she's not. She is not. She has a soft, low accent, but she leaps from one language to another without dragging with it the accent. And some of us will know people that are brought up in bilingual families who do this. So it's very important. So she, has a, she has this lowland Scott accent, which of course is different from the Gaelic in the north. And she's here. She dates it here. Uh, in time, she was here first time, as you've heard in February. Then later on in the year, she came back in the same year, in 1569. And she was put in a long cottage at one point, very long cottage, black and white. Now, we would think it was gorgeous because it looks like a sort of extended Shakespeare's house. How do we know? We had a dig here with the British Museum. I was fed up with lots of things being talked about about this castle, which were actually not true. But the dig revealed in description and depth and her own letter about being at the castle. And there it is about 60 feet long. It's a long cottage on two floors. She describes as the winds and injuries of heaven pouring in upon her. She would hate it, you see. We think black and white cottages are glamorous. 
But for someone brought up and knowing the Loire Valley and these huge chateaus and even in Scotland, these magnificent castles she went around, nevertheless, it was a shock to her to have a black and white hunting lodge, as she describes it. What's crucial about this hunting lodge, as she describes it, is it's actually embedded into the earth wall of the castle inside the mot. The main building where she'd been kept before, which was the royal apartments, are now not hers. And then you've got the main building itself, which Elizabeth says, which still stands, by the way, which Elizabeth says, that's mine, you can't use that. But the other thing that's crucial about this earth that she's driven into in her, in her cottage with her people is that it was absolutely damp. And it was so bad, she writes, my furniture and hangings are covered in mould every three days. Also, which is much more dangerous for her and psychologically damaging for her, is the privy is at the back of the cottage, the, the privy tip. So the stink of all the privies being tipped out were, were literally above the roof of her cottage. And she says it happens every Friday or Saturday and it is most disagreeable, the smell. Now, any of you out there who know something about medicine and the belief of medicine at the time will know that we were terrified of miasma, foul smell, believing that's nearly right, actually. That's what carried the disease. But, of course, it's the germs in these foul things. And Elizabeth didn't want to kill her, you know. She wanted her dead. That's not at all the same thing. Elizabeth, when she realised there wasn't going to be war, in the end, tried to break her. And actually, uh, on one occasion, when Mary was here, her shutters were opened and her priest was swinging dead outside the window like rotten fruit. He would be her confessor. But those who go, oh, was she allowed Catholic priest? Oh, sure enough. This is, remember, we didn't really get the Jesuits here till later in Elizabeth's reign. Priests were allowed, but that to be very discreet. And you can see why, can't you, politically, because the Catholic countries would be, hey, hang on a minute, you must let her have a faith. She had two priests here. And then another one of her gentlemen was found down one of the three wells dead. Now, all of this is almost a hint, isn't it? Pushing, pushing. So Mary went and stayed in other places. She was mostly in Sheffield, actually, um, in the manor house or the castle. And then she came back for a long stay here at Tuckery in 1585. So if you think back to that young woman who arrived at the gates, losing her twins, left her son behind, empty arms for a child she must have longed for, it was you know, only not even two when she left. And you think about how ill she was and you think about all of these things. She wasn't even 27. I mean, some would say that's busy. One of the great problems about Mary is there's a whole group of people who view her as a saint, really almost a saint, and another group who view her as a complete focus for trouble, brought it all on herself. So difficult, isn't it? Such bitterness at one side, such adoration at the other side, and in the middle stands a woman, a woman who made mistakes, who fell in love, who did wild things. No. She should have been in more control of herself when she describes, my heart is my own. It's not. Her womb belongs to her people. And the decisions that she made about who she consorted with. So she was just a bit too passionate, you know, Elizabeth from her lofty virginal throne. The last day here at Tuckery um, is, is rather interesting. She was here for 11 months. Uh, in fact, in total, she had been here four times not three, some people say four, but actually it's three, uh, four rather, and the last time for 11 months. And she did something rather extraordinary at this point, which I sort of think, hmm. Some people think of Mary, I should say the Queen Mary, really. Some people think about her as being rather, oh, and fragile and snatch me away on a gorgeous horse. Oh, yeah. Not at this point, necessarily, because something that caused immense rage was that on Maundy Week, it is traditional, as you know, still going on, that the monarch gives coins and washes the feet off and the poor people of an area. Still happening with their own queen. It's a bit tougher for the Tudors because they didn't only do that, they washed the feet of every person representing an age. If they were 80, they had 80 feet to, well, more than that, they had 60 feet to wash. So it must have got tougher as they got older. 
but um, had put an apron on and did this. This was done very diligently by Elizabeth. But what does Mary Stuart do? Mary Stuart, who's been prisoner for all these years, she gives out coins and cloth to the local poor children. Now, there's no question that's a deliberate to Elizabeth. I have the right to do this. I'm still a queen. Behold, something else she did. At this point, by the way, Shrove's been told to buzz off by Elizabeth because uh, she found out or heard the rumour, almost certainly it came directly from Bess, uh, that her husband had fallen in love. And in fact, it did come from that source uh, with Mary Queen Scott. So Elizabeth went, well, I'm not having this. I'm not having a nice time with her. I don't need to be super lovely to get out. So then we get this man coming in, uh, Agnès Paulet. He was a very interesting choice because he had been the French ambassador. So he spoke absolutely fluent French, and he understood all the conversations she was having all over the place. And uh, he made sure he kept an eye on Now, at one point, Mary had a canopy of state, which she was allowed, and put up in the great hall here at the castle. That was not hers. That was Elizabeth's. Elizabeth had made it clear she may not use that room because that is Elizabeth's estate, if you like, where she is. And Mary did it. Isn't that interesting? This, she's got this toughness about her. I mean, she'd been carted from pillar to post. You'd think being locked up here was bad. She'd had this terrible battle at Carberry Hill. She'd had that battle of Langside. She'd miscatched. She was strong, this woman. She was strong spiritually too. But I'm pretty positive that I can say that she also suffered with panic attacks. Interestingly, I found three cases of Elizabeth II. Remember, I'm a medical historian, so I'm interested in this reaction. One day, Mary is described as having run out here in Tutbury, in the castle. She's always within the walls, remember. And she was running about in the snow with bare feet, screaming. When people slap themselves or hurt themselves in some way, it's quite often to drive away the other thoughts. And this woman really, really was in a terrible state that day. And your heart must go out to her. If you've got any mercy in you, you realise the terrible distress. Plus, on top of this, Elizabeth had a court sitting in York for the whole 19 years of Mary's imprisonment to justify her what she was doing. Oh, they're investigating. So she had messengers arriving all the time. A cobweb of messengers coming from all over, making her answer questions. Did you know that Darnley was going to be killed? Were you involved in this? Were you already in an affair with Bothwell? All sorts of types of questions that would put the fear of God into people, all wrapped up in diplomatic language. So she had that pressure too. And we've all had letters that we've been dreading. It might be health scans, might be the bank, might be the loss of a relative. Mary was getting life-threatening questions and letters. All of her captivity must have driven into her. There must have been times when she'd had enough. So there was a terrific fuss about her canopy of state being in the Great Hall. It was torn down. And Amos Paulette is criticised heavily for this. But actually he was doing his duty. That's what he had to do. She wasn't allowed there. She knew she wasn't. She still went. It's about that time when Elizabeth comes out with a comment. I'm surprised nobody's poisoned her. Does that sound to you like who will rid me of this priest? Well... Interestingly, Paulette writes a very moving note to Her Majesty, which is general. But it has a very, very specific heart. In other words, it's wrapped up in diplomacy. He says, you have my body most utterly, Your Majesty, as your servant. But do not make a shipwreck of my soul. And when you hear that, you think... He's a great man, but he's absolutely refusing to do the wrong thing. And I feel a great sense of admiration for him. There's no doubt she'd had a very nice time with Shrewsbury at times, on Wingfield Manor, had parties, all this stuff, but that's why she found herself in a more difficult state. But then again, at the very beginning of her captivity, and that would have happened here at Tutbury, uh, she was busy sorting out the Duke of Norfolk as the next husband. She'd secretly put into Rome to be divorced from Bothwell, who was now absolutely crazy um, because it was useless and worthless to her. And of course, if she was dangerous to Elizabeth, imagine how dangerous she would be with a leading duke. 
the leading duke in terms of Catholicism. So we find ourselves looking at this woman, realising she'd got caught up in this plot. She'd sent not a very sensible present, it was a bit obvious, an embroidered pillow to put his head on. Well, Elizabeth put his head on it, all right. She chopped off his head. Elizabeth was clear about what she wanted in terms of loyalty. Some say it wasn't a pillow, it was a cushion. You can if you like. All I'm interested in is she, she'd done this, then she kept quiet. And then, of course, we get this last day of 11 months, and the panic setting in and the distress setting in and starting to fight back. It's almost certain that the Babington plot started here. The basis of that is she actually left here on Christmas Eve on that year and went to Chartley, which is about 12 miles away. She was a good rider, but then she got very crippled with arthritis and twisted. She'd been in these damn cold, windy castles, moved about in the middle of the night. You know how sick you feel when you get up in the morning for perhaps an early flight at five o'clock. It felt terrible. She'd be moved then because she, people mustn't see her in case there's an uprising. But actually, Elizabeth was very much more secure on her throne by then. Nobody had risen in. There was no knight in shining armour, was there? No Rome, no Paris, no holy Catholic Spain. A sad and distressed woman put on too much weight, twisted, forgotten. Well, not entirely. Elizabeth kept a firm eye on her. Suddenly this man called Babington from Derby, with the heart of a poet, starts to write and tells her he's loved her long, going to put her on the throne and all these wonderful dreams. And this bird in not such a gilded cage, some might argue committed suicide. I don't care if it goes wrong. I've got to get out of here. And I don't, I mean, I have a theory that he probably didn't expect her to write back. It's a bit like a fan writing to a superstar today. They get a letter, all right then, uh, quite unexpected. And whether we like it or not, there's no question that Mary did communicate through these secret letters. Now, the reason I'm saying that would have been discussed and dealt with here before Chartley, when it really kicked off over there, was because the brewing was coming in from Burton down the road here. Now, those of you who know about these things will know that even private households of a reasonable status, you know, farmers' wives, brewed their own beer. What was left over was pin money down at the market or a half a wheel of cheese because they got too much. Now, the beer was coming in from Burton because, of course, the household here was increased somewhat. Uh, and the need was by having Mary and her attendants. She had about 40 attendants when she was here. And a third of them were Scots and a third of them were French and a third of them were English. And although she had the wonderful Mary Livingstone with her and some very loyal servants and some gorgeous little sky terriers, there's no question that that woman could not have menstruated without half of Europe knowing about it. Because she's still in business. She would be watched. Her privacy was not something queens expect to have. But that was dangerous. And so there she is writing back to Babington these secret letters. Amongst her close group uh, was a priest uh, who was a code breaker. And he was also a double agent. It's a shock, that, isn't it? It's really quite a shock that a man of the cloth is a double agent. It's extraordinary. But in the end, it cost her a life. Above all our other prisons, she hated this the most. And that's because it reminded her of the day when she realised it was over. If you and I, listening to this, go and have an accident on a particular bit of motorway. When you go past it, you'll get a frisson. When you approach it, you might feel uncomfortable, you might even avoid the road. This reminded her of her absolute destruction as a queen. But she kept her dignity despite increasingly poor illness and this terrible business of this ulcer which must have been agony as well. Some of the things that made her comfortable here at Tuckbury, which will make you smile, she had the most expensive hairdresser in Europe, apparently. Don't know why, but got to keep a man busy. And, uh, and also, we talk about the worst jobs in history. And if any of you ever saw that programme, I was in one of them here at Tuckbury. But we discovered something after I'd appeared in that, which was an even worse job. There was considerable concern. These are little tidbits I'm giving you, by the way. Hope you like them. Um, in the royal apartments when she was up there, there was concern that she might be lowered by sheets through the privy hole down into the moat and run off 
because there was also drop holes in some parts of the castle. Now, our moat was never wet. Otherwise, that wouldn't be a good idea. Our moat was always dry because we're 154 up, and we've got these palisades, sharp sticks, and all that. Anyway, um, her last keeper, Amos Paulette, who I mentioned, was so concerned about this possibility. He had a little hut built in, in, the, mo in the moat with two blokes on duty constantly. We had to watch to see what was happening with the royal deposits and make sure that she wasn't one of them. So they were there. You can imagine. Oh, a bit of action. No. And then carrying on talking. You know, I mean, there were some ludicrous bits in here too. You see, history, yes, it's a serious matter. But please understand people lived and loved and had their babies and laughed together too. Mary Queen Scots had a great sense of humour, played five musical instruments. She could play the virginal to concert standard. She was tall, beautiful, striking, royal to her bones. But she definitely was the daughter of debate. And when she left these, these British Isles for the last time on the 8th of February in 1587, there must have been a quite a rush of relief from some people, particularly Privy Council, but Elizabeth never really got over it. And in her last two weeks of her life, she's recorded plucking up her clothes, pulling at her clothes. Why did she make me do this? I didn't want to do this. But all of the time, I still maintain she didn't want to kill her. She wanted her dead. So there's Mary Queen of Scots at Tutbury Castle. There's a lot more uh, as well about other lives that have been here, including Henry VIII. But you're aware of this woman more than anyone else, this drifting presence. And we have prayers for her here regularly, we had services for her as well. And people come from all over the world to sort of breathe her in a bit. So although she hated it here, it really marked her. And because of that, it marked us here in Britain and at Tutbury Castle. Thank you for listening.